So good evening uh, again. I was told that we had some um, technical uh, difficulties. Um, I'm uh, tonight. I'm hosting um, three amazing speakers: uh, Spela Petric, Agnieszka Volochko, and uh, Benjamin uh, Fele. It's with me. Uh, we are going to talk about the uh, Spela's project uh, play. But before I um, um, present them a little bit uh, more in detail and also before we start talking about uh, the artwork, I'm inviting you to have a look on a documentary that uh, we prepared about the project so you'll be more familiar with it and uh, we'll get the idea about what uh, we are talking. So Matthias, please can you start the video? Let's see if it's working now. Play is about a game between an AI robot and a plant. Um, to make this happen, a robot that is controlled by an artificial intelligence uh, that sees the cucumber plants growing beneath it with a 3D scanner, a LiDAR, uh, a camera. And as the cucumber plant grows, and of course moves by growing, the robot is watching it carefully and also making sort of a mental image of the cucumber. And in response to the mental image, it moves its own tendrils. You know, a cucumber has tendrils with which it tries to hold on to anything in its vicinity. And in this case, we designed the robot so that it has tendrils of its own. And these are wires with um, colorful bulbs at the end of them, which the robot controls according to uh, its own intention. And the intention is actually to try to play a game uh, with the growing cucumbers. And this game is not necessarily defined uh, with a pre-given framework that is based on a competition or a very clear uh, set goal that we as humans uh, would anticipate. But rather, it's about the possibility for an ontological testing and, and exploration between these two very, very different entities which actually develop the rules of the game uh, as they interact, as they grow with each other. Play is an incredibly complex project. It's, it's really an assemblage of uh, uh, electronic materials, uh, organic materials like the plant, different types of conceptual ideas, theoretical ideas, and so forth. And all of these things have to come together in, in a very integrated way. Basically, also, all the times of these things have to come in together in an integrated way. The plant has to be growing at a certain time. The, uh, the materials have to arrive at a certain time. The right people have to be in the space at the right time in order for this entire thing to come together. Controlling all of these things across um, uh, multiple time scales with complicated movements is a very challenging endeavor. And so to be able to see this all come together with, it, with all the competencies of everyone that's involved and everyone's uh, myriad ways of doing things and their capabilities, seeing it all to come together in the final piece is really incredible. As usually with um, Spiller's work, it's always a challenge to make a piece where the plants and technology feels good. Um, and also, um, not just as an artwork uh, presented in an art space, but also in a process. Because a play is kind of a developing through time, so that's why it's made in a modular way. Uh, all the elements can be changed one by one. Um, so in such a way, it's a kind of a computer rack uh, where you can change modules, uh, upgrade them through time. But on the other side, um, one of the concerns to developing the work was also that the plant is not over dominated by the technology. So literally technology 
tries to be as invisible as possible, but at the same time, plant can um, have its own space to grow, to, to prosper, to uh, shine in this way. And also through the development of work was um, the challenge, how to show the interaction between these two. Uh, so between the technology um, that is AI driven, the invisible uh, computer behind and the plant. Um, and that's why we choose to go with this um, playful uh, balls that by themselves are playful, are toys used on one side by plants and on the other side by technology. We were thinking about how to, um, well, how, how the machine would sense the plant, right? And one non-intrusive way uh, to to do this is by looking at it, of course. And if we only look at color data, it's hard to get all the information out of it. So we opted for a depth image. And here we perceive the distance from the camera to the plant. And uh, by doing this, we can establish, let's say, a 3D model of the plant. And well, this allows us to get a uh, perspective, get a understanding of how the plant moves, how it grows and where it is even. So by that, we can establish a point of contact uh, with, the, with the plant. And, and yeah, this is the, 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 machine, the machine vision part was uh, important here to, uh, even if we get the depth data, the distance data, we still have to algorithmically determine how to interact with the plant and how to read from this distance data. It's, it's a fact that these machines, these uh, devices that capture 3D data are actually quite expensive if you want a, a certain resolution of this data. And of course, you have it already in your phones, uh, but these devices are not so accurate, right? If you want something really accurate, it's usually expensive. So what we did is we used a device that only records one dimension of this de depth data. And then we put it on a rail and drove this device across the rail. So we actually uh, capture a 3D uh, image by, uh, let's say, tricking the device and then merging this data together to get yeah, the, the full 3D image of the plant. Uh, we used uh, machine learning um, to kind of learn the patterns and uh, subsequently uh, kind of establish some kind of interaction. First of all, we didn't want to encode like if and else statements about a certain state and then how the machine should react to that state. So in order to kind of minimize the assumptions that we give to the system, we use like a group of, again, algorithms called neural networks. We use a specific neural network called an autoencoder, which gets an image, which represents the current state of the plant and outputs the reconstruction of itself going through some kind of bottleneck in the middle. We use that output to kind of predict how far the a ball should drop. Main components for the AI to interact with the real world is uh, a wire. So that's the uh, physical component of the AI. Uh, and then a second component would be a touch sensor. The same principles as in a touch screen. Um, the only difference is that we don't use a glass, we use a wire. Um, we measure the capacitance of it, and this is how AI is getting a discrete signal to measure if a plant is touching a wire. And then the physical interaction with the AI is moving a wire uh, by controlling a stepper motor. So it's basically a simple way of pulling wires up and down with the stepper motor and sensing the touch of the plant by measuring the capacitance of that wire of the, or the changing capacitance of that wire. The challenge here was making this on a grand scale. Well, of course, prototyping was done with one stepper motor and then we had to scale this with 36 motors. And then the difficult part was the sensor, how to get rid of all the noise and how to measure a very small capacitance from the plant. The first thing, cucumbers are outdoor plants. 
So we had to um, give it a bit of a trial basis to make them grow inside because it's not ordinary to grow outdoor plants inside. So we had to get the right lighting conditions, the right amount of water, uh, and all of that with a lot of lot of hard work and dedication, we managed to make the plants grow. And uh, when we transplanted them from the pots to the installation, we had to be super, super careful because the tendrils of the cucumbers are super fragile and they only have a certain amount of movement in them. That's why ply also has these 36 balls hanging on them so the tendrils can have sort of a choice where to wind and which way to wind because it is not um, a given that it will wind to a certain ten to a certain ball that we would like. They have a mind of their own and it's very interesting to observe them and see how they react. The speed of their reaction is very interesting because they move sort of in a jerky motion and they can like wind around a plant in about half an hour and then can change their mind and unwind. So through the time lapse, you can see the fluid motion, but if you observe them and take your time, then you can see sort of jerkiness. And that's the way the plant moves in real time. This for us was a way of thinking about what the possible applications of this so-called artificial intelligence might be, stemming from the presumption that all organisms are capable of play, that play is uh, somewhat fundamental to life. Um, and we can recognize that, of course, in humans, uh, in animals uh, that are close to us, like cats and dogs, and sometimes goats or birds, but it's very hard for us to imagine crustaceans uh, being able to play or jellyfish. And similarly, plants don't fall into that scope either. But here with using this AI, artificial intelligence, and its sensorial uh, ever so patient apparatus, we are able to somehow enter plant time and also react within plant time to the plant's uh, sensorial um, milieu uh, in its own speed. And that's what we are hoping to achieve, to sort of glimpse uh, into the possibility for this playful exchange with a plant and this robot that stands in for our human desire to do so with plants. Okay, that was a real documentary about uh, the project. Um, but before I, uh, I present the speaker, I, uh, my duty is to, um, to tell you that play is currently on display in Eindhoven uh, and will be there uh, until May. So those of you eager enough uh, to see it can go and see it there. However, the beginning of the whole series of projects, uh, the project Lip Reading, uh, it's now exhibited in uh, 2121 Design Site Gallery in Tokyo. Now, uh, let me first introduce Spela, um, who is a lead character here, although that we just learned that the real star is the cucumber growing in the project. Uh, Špela Petrić is a Slovenian new media artist and a former scientific researcher, currently based between Ljubljana, Slovenia, and Amsterdam, Netherlands. She received a PhD in biomedicine at the University of Ljubljana and advanced master arts from Lucie, uh, Brussels. Her practice is a multi-species endeavor a composite of natural sciences, wet media, and performance. 
She envisions artistic experiments that enact strange relationalities to reveal the ontological and epistemological underpinnings of our bio-technological societies and challenge the scope of the adjacent possible. Agnieszka, who is with us, we haven't seen you in the video, but you are listed as a, one of a collaborator. Agnieszka Wolorsko is a lecturer at Aki Academy of Art and Design, where she teaches philosophy of art course and has initiated a Biometer, an artistic research program that explores how to work with living matters. Parallel to this, she's also art curator and writer. And last but not least, Benjamin Fele, uh, who has a master's degree in cognitive science and currently works at Faculty of Electrical Engineering, where his focus are generative adversarial networks for clothing synthesis. I would like to hear more about it. Uh, his interest also lay in the fields of meta-learning and knowledge representation, where his aim is to make machines learn faster and in more general ways. Um, we saw uh, other people in the video who were collaborators in, in your project, and probably they are not even all of them, no, Spiller? There are even more. So, um, but before um, delving into the, the project play, um, I will ask you, Spela, to tell us a little bit, you know, the, the meat around the, the project. You now, what is your artistic interest of working with plants and, um, and finally, how you come to use the AI? now in your recent projects mm -hmm. but maybe to understand better why plants no? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it was about uh, five years ago that i uh, became a bit curious about why exactly um, we always seem to position the plants in somehow in the background and why they represent this ultimate alterity uh, to us uh, in such a way that we can basically treat them like a living resource, living material. And uh, if we do appreciate them, they're often in relation to us. So they're the lungs of the planet or, you know, our, the food we eat. Um, and so I looked into that through a series of artistic projects. Uh, uh, the opus was called Confronting Vegetal Otherness. Um, and through this, I sort of instigated novel and odd relations with plants where uh, this intercognition would take place. So intercognition is a, a, a sort of like a relationship where the plant perceives something of the human and vice versa, the human perceives um, something of the plant. And because of um, the, the ways that uh, plants are metaphysically constructed, I also looked at these relations on different levels. But underlying um, the, the attitude we have towards plants is basically the uh, scala nature. Uh, so it goes back to Aristotle, to ancient Greece, uh, when plants were basically positioned at the border between mineral uh, and life. So they were the lowest possible living organism. And still, we sort of see them as uh, embodying everything we, everything opposite as we would imagine being the good life, which is what humans um, possess, right? So they are not autonomous, but instead open to the environment or heteronomous. They don't have really an essence. They're built as a repetition of parts which can, upon uh, their loss, be replaced. They reproduce 
uh, through vegetative reproduction or cloning. So they don't possess this same type of individuality that begins with birth and ends with death of the individual. And of course, uh, they, are, they don't have internal organs such as the brain, which makes us, uh, if we use humans at, as the yardstick, um, think that they are uh, somehow less capable of um, being in this world. Now, um, we might want to disagree with these claims, but uh, the tricky thing with plants is that it's not, uh, what's frightening about them is not that they lack all these things or that we um, do not recognize these properties um, that they might have, but in fact, that uh, they get by just fine without them. And uh, even more so, they are basically the ultimate uh, resource, ultimately generous, because it is actually through their excess that all of the rest of life on Earth exists. So we are sort of faced with this alien that is quite majestic uh, and um, vibrant and also always a bit close to death. And it's hard for us to really wrap our heads around this and have um, an intimate relationship. So after uh, or while I was working on, on, on plants and, and trying to get a, uh, come to grips with their ontology, um, I also developed, uh, in collaboration with Mika Tursic, a couple of projects that deal with algorithms. So I, I became familiar with the processes of algorithmic governance and um, beyond just the um, social platforms, which we think uh, is the main way we interact with algorithms. So Facebook, uh, uh, Amazon, um, Google, and so forth. Um, the pervasiveness of algorithms uh, is something that we are increasingly needing not just to deal with, but also to a little bit better understand. And Shoshana Zuboff talks about this in her book um, about surveillance capitalism. So at one point I realized that actually um, what we fear in relation to algorithms as humans are one of the things that we might fear is the fact that um, as data, when our bodies become data, we turn into these very leaky vessels. Uh, the data is extracted, parsed and, and put into categories, um, sort of fragmenting our bodies and exterior, sort of uh, penetrating us and spreading us over these, these large areas. And this ontology really reminded me of the way we look at plants. So that was a moment of, of synthesis or um, uh, let's say um, a, a change uh, to actually consider not plants as ulterior, but rather to see ourselves as construed, as plant-like. So for this, um, I borrowed a term from Catriona Mortimer Sandilands uh, called the vegetariat. Um, the vegetariat for me represents this flattened ontology where uh, there is much less distinction between plants and humans when we are caught in the eye of the algorithm. And so this was sort of the starting point of, for the next opus, uh, which we will be addressing today, where there's we, we, we construct intimate relationships between plants and algorithms in order to better understand uh, the materiality, the effect, and the ways algorithms can be written and we use plants 
um, insofar as writing for them means also writing algorithms for ourselves. Mm. Okay, thank you. That was ontological. Um, Agnieszka, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your philosophical background so that it will be a little bit easier to understand what is your take uh, um, on uh, this phenomenology we are talking to today? Yeah, sure, thank you. So, um, um, so first of all, I was really thankful uh, for Sprella to engage in me in this fascination, uh, fascinating project. And uh, it was somehow surprising because my specialization is not in uh, AI, it's not in digital media. So my background is in philosophy, philosophy of art, in the focus on posthumanism, new materialism, affect theory. Um, and yet her whole work on plants and searching for the relation of plants, even though I was not really busy with them, uh, forced me uh, to, to to reevaluate actually what um, what does it mean to to live to have a body and what are the conditions of bodies in these days considering uh, new media and um, uh, take a digital media uh, or biotechnologies in particular. So, um, so yeah, so my focus in my research, um, uh, I basically researched the notion of contamination and um, uh, understanding bodies through affect as relations of transformation, contamination. And here, uh, I, I ma mainly I looked at human bodies, um, uh, bacteria, or animal bodies, uh, microbiomes. Um, however, I think we, especially in the humanities, um, where I'm from uh, academically, uh, came at certain deadlock. Um, so recently uh, we have a blooming of the uh, plant theory, as if through plant, human can be saved. Um, all the problems of the humanities um, somehow uh, uh, have been recognized um, uh, as, um, as possible to unravel or to find new ways of thinking through plant. So, so some of what already um, Spella told us, right, about lack of essence, lack of individuality, possibility of infinite mutation and transformation. These are these are concepts and ideas that have been already, you know. Um, uh, pervading philosophical thought, literally thought, culturally thought, but somehow we lack of um, materialization. Uh, um, we, we lack of um, desire to think even about materialization um, of possibility to, to be otherwise. And uh, yeah, and in my research um, uh, through our, our Spella's work, um, I've, you know, I find this new urgency that there is a possibility to create an, an, an urgency in particular to create uh, the conditions of thinking otherwise through plant about our bodies as human. Mm. Thank you. Um, Benjamin, um, you're a computer engineer with strong interest on learning, meta-learning machine learning, all kinds of learnings. Um, explain us a little bit uh, um, what you're doing as an engineer. Okay, yeah, um, so thanks. Thanks uh, for letting me letting me uh, be part of this, this discussion. Uh, so yeah, as you've already told, I work uh, at Faculty of Electrical Engineering, in engineering where I uh, work with generative uh, networks uh which for clothing synthesis but the whole framework of generative uh generative uh, networks is quite more uh general and the and it is part of the field called called machine learning uh which is in uh, described very short, short shortly um a way uh, a way to uh, let's say yeah a way a way to train uh computer models to uh, recognize patterns 
and or and act upon them. Uh, now, how they how they act upon them, it's it's uh, usually up to a human being, but as we'll see later in our case, it's a little bit more uh, up to the plant. Um, so yeah, that is machine learning, and that is closely related to uh, human learning, right? Because humans are kind are actually very good at recognizing patterns and uh, and acting upon them in in some way. Um, so uh, without being too uh, redistant, re reductionistic, um, my aim would be like in a future career to uh, inform uh, inform machine learning uh, by studying human condition, uh, human, human cognition, uh, and that's where the meta learning part comes in, uh, especially in a way. Uh, so me meta learning is just like uh, a general uh, notion of learning to learn. Uh, so for humans, for example, uh, meta in, with humans, for example, meta learning would be. Uh, like, for example, uh, taking a certain strategy when uh, trying to understand something or just uh, understanding or uh, being aware of one's goals in a certain situation. And that gives us humans a very uh, flexible way of solving problems, you know, because we can we, we've solved like a lot of problems in our lives in the past and any new problem that we see uh, is likely to be a uh, we are likely to be able to uh, to solve it in a similar way, right? Uh, so we kind of transfer across tasks, tasks uh, the way we learn. And in recent years, that's also be, been an uh, emerging paradigm in machine learning, especially in, in that paradigm is called meta-learning. Uh, now, how does this all uh, relate to, uh, to uh, the Spiller's project? Um, is in a way that Meta learning is uh, so. First of all, we are not uh, explicitly working with uh, meta learning or uh, learning in general. But in a sense, what 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 one could ask uh, is what problem we are trying to solve. But on the other hand, like meta learning, and also we we are asking asking ourselves a lot about how to solve that problem. And that's, that's I think, kind of the essence of what I'm interesting, interested in. And I, I think uh, a, part, a big part of how, how, I see, uh, work, how I see myself working on Spiller's project. Um, and just a small distraction. Where did you three met? Where did you three get to know each other? It was because of the project? Well, partially, yes, I guess. Uh, it was a sort of a chain reaction of uh, starting to work on this plant machine. And um, uh, one programmer led to another, led to a third. So that's how I met Sabine. I mean, through Tim uh, and Tim, I met through um, his professor at uh, the uh, Faculty for, of Informatics and Computer Science. Uh, whereas uh, with Agnieszka, we've known each other now for about five years and um, we met when I was invited to give a lecture in Leiden University and she was uh, one of the guest uh, hosts, uh, like a host, a philosophical host. Uh, yes. Good, and maybe just one uh, um, curiosity. Now, speaking about the authorship, you no, know, um, how would be the, the what would be the distribution here? You know, what is the deal? <laughs> so, uh, should I, uh, I guess, as as the boss and as the the author, uh, answer this question? Um, yeah. The deal with these projects is that they are a lot about the process and even within this, this concept of uh, the vegetariat, uh, for me, the question of who needs to learn how to code, uh, the question of who, de who decides uh, or who, who knows who decides and who decides who decides. Um, 
and um, the question of how do you actually work together is really essential uh, to the development of the project. But the project is, of course, uh, it emerges in um, the real world where we are also faced with artistic funding, with collaborations with different um, scientific institutes and within these frameworks, um, as well as organizationally, um, that, like my name is on the project as the author, as the one driving the concept and ultimately as the one who uh, is sort of very stubborn in making it happen. Um, in terms of uh, whose contribution uh, or whose vision gets realized in the end, it's, I think, much more hazy. And it is actually about not really knowing where it all ends up because of uh, the plants. And I think we will later mention this, right? Like how uh, plant materiality plant agency shapes this project literally what are the limits of computation significantly impacted significantly impacted what the the um, uh, form of the project is and finally you know the very very precious uh, inputs and and these long conversations and the struggle of working together with people coming from very, very different lived experiences, as well as uh, different, bringing different expertise. So the aim is more about, uh, the aim is to listen to each other and to learn how to listen to each other, rather than to realize the author's idea. Um, yeah, as I ask that because now I'm reflecting, uh, um, in real time, I have to admit that re you are really good in this um, per interpersonal relationship management and intersectorial um, uh, knowledge that comes together, you know, and it, it, uh, it, um, uh, you really need to have something uh, um, uh, very special to um, keep this big group of so diverse people uh, uh, together. Um, but okay, that was just a small digression uh, um, um, from uh, what I was um, thinking to to ask. And um, um, what as I was planning to ask you, Spela, is um, um, the, basic, the basic conceptual premises of play in relation to previous two uh, iterations of working with plants and AI. Uh, you learn, we all learn a lot of in these uh, first two phases. Now we are here in the third, which is um, still not fully functional because um, as we learn, it's a, a, a project in process and it opens again and again. New and uh, unexpected um, ways of uh, development. So, but still, you know, it's different from the previous two. So, mm -hmm. what's the difference? What what have you learned uh, from the previous two? Mm -hmm. So, the umbrella project, which is kind of this utopic idea of the plant machine, is to make an AI think it is itself a plant. And the reason for this is, of course, to explore sort of the or push the algorithms to the limits in terms of um, trying to uh, get an answer uh, for a question we don't really know how to phrase properly. And between the this is uh, automatically it creates a tension because we're using scientific methods. And so far as uh, computation has been developed within the domain of uh, science, right, uh, to ask more uh, like philosoph philosophical questions. And this is why uh, this is really important to the projects. Otherwise, we would be um, able to come up with a solution. 
this is an artistic project because the solution will forever escape us. And the path to there uh, is what I find uh, really important as a contribution to a conceptual understanding of the field of algorithms as well as the capacity of plants. So with the first project, which is the Institute for Inconspicuous Languages, uh, that was a fairly, fairly simple project where we used uh, li reading lips uh, with a, a pre-written uh, neural network uh, for um, reading lips of humans, but because of uh, cognitive mistake, apophenia, because stomata, the leaf pores on the bottom of uh, leaves, they're very tiny, microscopic. Uh, if we uh, follow them with a time lapse, uh, we see that they open and close just like mouths. So we asked a uh, neural network developed for human lip reading to try to interpret what the plants are saying and also at the same time ask uh, an interpreter, a human interpreter for the deaf, uh, Buen Mord, uh, to try to decipher this, right? So it was sort of a humorous um, project uh, which actually spoke to how oftentimes we use, uh, we insist on a logocentrism, so the, the use of human language to try to understand uh, non-humans, in this case, plants. Uh, the second one, uh, Vegetariate Work Zero, addressed uh, biosurveillance protocols, which we willingly uh, submit to, namely um, how smartwatches has, uh, have for many people become become a way of connecting to their own body because smartwatches and the applications that go with them allow us to get better sleep, allow us to uh, track our stress levels and of course keep our body in shape. But in this uh, project uh, we imagine what if like you know, some humans hack these plants and put them on drill machines in order to uh, you know count steps when they're actually not uh, training. Uh, what if these um, consumers, uh, producers of data, were in fact plants. So uh, with amplifiers, we measure electrical currents uh, that plants actually have, much like we do in nerves. And then that cellular activity is amplified and converted into the pressing of a drill machine. And finally, the smartwatch registers this as steps and because algorithms are um, formally indifferent they just you know take up that information uh, uh, in spite of it actually coming from a completely unexpected organism which is the plant and so we ask you know what does this mean when the plants themselves also become consumers since uh, there is a, a, a you know this um, a way of saying vote with your wallet, you know, and the question does, do all ecological entities have to become consumers in order for them to count as something? So finally, uh, this third um, vignette within the plant machine, which is like, uh, is the first one where we actually employ and actually start writing an artificial intelligence, or uh, we would I would rather call it a neural network type of um, algorithm for its interaction directly with the plant. And we use this type of um, um, developments in uh, computer vision and uh, yes, uh, machine learning. Uh, because they allow for an open-ended process of interaction. Uh, because we do not necessarily have to tell um, the computer in advance exactly what its goal is to a certain extent. Of course, this is also a total utopia, right? To be able to just like allow for the, the the program to grow by itself or under the control of the plants. But at least we attempt uh, to do this and we try to see how far we actually can go uh, with 
this concept. And this is um, uh, a practice of uh, radical empiricism to be able uh, to, you know, roll up the sleeves even um, and work together because myself, I don't program. So it's really important that we work as a tight team to try to understand exactly uh, what is going on while also uh, the growth between or this so-called play, right, is happening simultaneously with the plant uh, and the AI. So the algorithm um, and the both the plant and the algorithm end up as being absolutely uh, unique completely and completely situated within this concrete relationship that they have. I think that explains it. Okay. Um, I saw Benjamin having a lot of fun in one moment. Uh, probably you, you saw yourself uh, in um, this, what Spela says, uh, um, um, uh, because the solution will always escape us, no? But um, as far as your and team as work is concerned, you know, you were there to provide solutions. You know? so exactly, exactly. Uh, that was like an interesting paradox, you know. When when I first started working with Spela, I was expecting Spela to tell me, okay, uh, and m maybe also team expected something similar. I was expecting Spela to tell me, okay, now we got this problem, we have to we have to so uh, solve it. Uh, here's the data. We are gonna collect that, and that's gonna be the output. But it doesn't quite work like that. It's uh, as opposed to you know uh, uh, how it goes in scientific uh, community where, where where there are clear uh, uh, cl where the problems are usually clearly defined and where there are metrics or at least uh, metrics uh, uh, are developed that that can kind of judge the how well the system performs. There's no such thing here and. That that was uh, really kind of the the maybe not with this particular project, but when I first started working with Spela, uh, that was kind of an interesting uh, paradigm shift for me. Not to expect to uh, solve anything anything in particular, but more to think about and like Spela said, like talk talk about how one would approach. Uh, a specific problem in each uh, different in each of our disciplines and get 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 along that way. Uh, so yeah, I totally agree with Pilar that it's, it's important to 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 be able to communicate uh, such ideas uh, and, uh, and 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 yeah, I, I think I think that was probably the biggest kind of shock for me uh, at the uh, at the beginning of of me working with Pilar. Um, can we say that uh, this experience of working with Pela that you repeated quite several times was transformative for you? As a, in, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, in a sense, of course it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's 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 what we can all agree with. It's different uh, different than working with uh, with uh, with you know like a well specified problem like I do for my real job. Uh, so. Uh, uh, so, so yeah. In, in that sense, I would say I would say that it, it, in in uh, it made me think differently about plants, which is which I wasn't at all familiar with before, and it made me different. Uh, made me think different about machines as well, you know, because what we built is a robot, even though it doesn't have like a, a, robo a robotic arm that I'm used to from the lab uh, from before, or it's still a robot. And and then it, I kind of started asking myself, well. Uh, and we also talked about this, like how how um, how uh, how the Google servers, for example, that also collect a lot of data and they they also model that data. How that is also some kind of a robot in in a, if we if we maybe stretch the definition a little bit. And this these are all kind of uh, these, these are all things that uh, I don't think I would be thinking on that level if I would, wouldn't be so closely closely uh, in contact with. This, this particular work. Um, well, this particular work that it's obviously not real, Agnieszka, what is real, what is not real? What would you say <laughs> from the point of um, a philosophical perspective? Um, you were not uh, involved as much as you are now in the previous two projects, but you somehow step in uh, 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 with the play. Tell us a little bit about it. 
Well, not exactly. So <laughs> I was uh, actually curator of uh, Spela's second project, the work Zero. Um, so I I had the chance to even you know work physically <laughs> uh, next to it. So I know the the, the technical uh, like on the surface level, but. Uh, so I already got uh, familiar to Spela's um, idea and um, and problem through her also concept of vegetarian that uh, she uh, mentioned. Uh, but I guess, I don't know if um, this is where you want to go, but I, at this point, I think it's important to mention, um, you know, this distinction. And Spela, I think you mentioned this either in the video at the beginning, the distinction between the play and the game. Uh, because from the philosophical point of view, um, as a, a, a being not, you know, the media or game theories, so uh, this is, I have to, you know, underline strongly, I don't have this specialization, but from a more philosophical, general philosophical idea is that there should be, you know, a clear distinction because it has a consequences for not only the way uh, how we view relation between the bodies uh, that are in contact and in relation with each other, but also how we define them, right? So uh, play um, uh, would be distinct from a game uh, because a game would, ha would have to have a clear uh, goals, clear rules, and then um, clear definition of agents. While play uh, has a sort of more, would have more ontological uh, 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 characteristic where it's uh, more an expression of bodies, how they are, that actually through play, bodies are shaped, are expressed, and only then can define themselves and are defined. So it's different if you would look at the hierarchy, right? So in order to play a game, you have to have a clear defined uh, bodies, their roles, their capacities and um, the aims while play, uh, the play defines and only through play, the bodies are already shaped, right? As a second so, form of happening. So... So now when I'm when we have this distinction and when I hear uh, Benjamin and Spela, you know, talk uh, and also you, Yuri, when you ask this question about, OK, so who is who is the main agent, right? Who is the responsible for the work? And somehow it's it's beautifully um, uh, explains itself because at play there is a collect certain collectivity that it's, you know, ontologically prior so through the play, the agents uh, only then are shaped, right? So I would say this is a play not only between the plant and the machine as we define it, but also about the, all the, the bodies that are involved in caring, in managing, in trying to figure it out, how to condition uh, this play, right? So, um, so uh, it's it's very intriguing because we do not know yet what will happen and what actually are these bodies at the end. Is it really a plant? You know, this is a cucumber as we define it, but then can we actually eat it? Is it, you know, is it moral now to eat this cucumber? And what with this, uh, this AI, uh, so what kind of knowledge it will have uh, uh, about this, this new body would, would it start to care about this cucumber? So I'm maybe now speculating too much, I'm going too far away, but um, uh, so yeah, so from my point of view, these are the, the most intriguing question and also findings uh, that uh, we need to redefine also about yeah, what is the authorship um, uh, and uh, um, what is the production, how, how should we care about the, the art um, uh, research and art process in this context? Mm -hmm. Well, but yes, yes, when I was uh, thinking about play, you no, know, there must be something, you no, know, that to distinguish um, a play as playing with our fingers or with play that has a certain desire, um, even um, curiosity, 
uh, pleasure involved. No, because when we are talking about the co-working on this project, I can somehow feel uh, what was, you know, this energy that was gluing all of you together. No, but then if we are going a little step, uh, a step ahead, no, and when we start thinking this um, with these patterns, um, when we are thinking about the machine and the plant, no, can it be there something also? No? Or is this too, or I'm trying to anthropomorphize uh, the whole thing? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I understand your question. Um, so, what do you mean? Do you mean uh, like there there has to be another agent, uh, um, um, more more just than plant and machine? Uh, could you maybe maybe I didn't understand it, sir. But you know what is distinguishing uh, playing? Uh, ah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah fingers and just you know like okay so so again we are going to the more philosophical so sorry to bore you so so you know like philosopher has, has the tendency to go to the meta levels right <laughs> so this is the meta language so indeed the play and the, in when you and when you understand it on the ontological level it means that this is how bodies are already Right. So it's not about the distinction or am I at play now or not? Am I uh, like what are the characteristics in order to recognize that you are at play? It would be already uh, identification. So it would be already a game. A play uh, understood on the ontological level means that we are already our bodies, living bodies, uh, are all have already a capacity and way of being as these relations of negotiation, of risk, of transformation, right? And through joy that is released, it's really also almost affect theory. So through this, this um, through this relation, the joy might be released where you pursue further this act of play of relating and transforming. Or you know because of the risk and uh, and a certain just like this plant you know it's not maybe comfortable or it's not allowing you to flourish you you disattach and go into another dire uh, direction so this capacity to relate and this capacity to transform is conditioned by the 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 play as as an ontological phenomenon. So in in the moment when you start to think about you know uh, like you're playing your fingers, so what do I have from it? You are at the game because you try to identify it, and it's okay. It's just it's just um, it's interesting and and urgent I think to to start to map this relation and what what is happening and what are the implication. Uh, uh, for, for not only us as humans, but understanding that it's it, it's characteristic to all living bodies. But then, then you know, we come to algorithm and AI, and then the whole concept of what is life. And I think this is uh, another urgent topic. I, I would like I would like to say. Uh, describe as in having a capacity uh, to play in general in in layman's uh, terms not not plants no of course as uh, I've uh, uh, spoken about before and not AI uh, I think this brings us to the cusp of what we can um, uh, grasp and at this uh, point I would really like to read you a, a short passage uh, by David Graeber, who actually uh, is probably quoted a little story between two uh, Taoists, uh, Taoists uh, it's a famous Taoist story. Uh, so Zhuangzi and Hu Zi were strolling on a, on a bridge over the river, river Hao, when the former observed, see how the minnows dart between the rocks. Such is the happiness of fishes. You not being a fish, said Huazi, how can you possibly know what makes fish happy? And I, and you not being I, said Zhuangzi, 
How can you know that I don't know what makes a fish happy? If I, not being you, cannot know what you know, replied Huazi, does it not follow that from the very fact that you, not being a fish, cannot know what makes a uh, fish happy? Let us go back, said Zhuangzi, to the original question. You asked me how I knew what makes fish happy. The very fact you asked shows that you knew I knew, as I did know from my own feelings on this bridge. <laughs> so, uh, and then he goes on that, that uh, I'll just read this because it's, he, he says, it, says it quite uh, beautifully. Uh, this uh, anecdote is usually taken as a confrontation between two irreconcilable approaches to the world, the logician versus the mystic. Um, but after thinking about the story for years, it struck me that this was the entire point of um, um, them discussing this. Uh, Zhuangzi, uh, who wrote it down, uh, he showed uh, himself to be defeated by his logician friend. By all accounts, Zhuangzi and Haozi were the best of friends. They liked to spend uh, hours arguing like this. Surely that was what Zhuangzi really uh, was getting at. Uh, we can each understand what the other is feeling because arguing about the fish, we are doing exactly what the fish are doing. They're having fun. Uh, they're doing something for the sheer pleasure of it. So they're engaging in a form of play. And so I really love this, right? Because uh, even if uh, we, we look at animals, uh, it is, and, and even the, the scientists that study rats at play, they uh, are in this awkward moment when they try to define what play is, not just a game, but like, the, what are the components of this? And somehow uh, it is, not definable in, in those certain terms, but being people who have uh, the capacity for joy, we are able to uh, recognize this. It might be that we are misrecognizing it, but the feeling is there. So this is what I hope uh, that we will be able to observe in this plant machine construction so that there is a potential that we also see this as play this feeling, uh, so to speak. And that brings us to, to Benjamin, who needs to encode this joy and all the assumptions you mentioned. Huh? <laughs> Since he is the extension of the AI, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I speak the AI language, <laughs> the neural network language. Uh, yeah, so to, to kind of uh, uh, make everything more concrete, um, there is uh, this notion that we were going through that uh, we do not want to our machine learning or neural neural, neural networks to uh, perform any kind of specific interaction in, in a sense that uh, we like you saw in the video like we didn't want to say okay now if uh, if the um, if the plant is at that distance, we want to move uh, the uh, so the balls towards that towards that plant. Uh, for that reason, we uh, we employed our autoencoders and also a little classifier at the end. But the autoencoder is really the core of of uh, this uh, of our system, at least on uh, machine learning side. Um, and the the task of the autoencoder is simple, right? It just uh, reconstructs the lidar image. Uh, that it gets from the camera every, every uh, from from the lidar every 15 minutes, um, and using a heuristic uh, and knowing that uh, the reconstruction is never go going to be perfect because it goes through that uh, some kind of bottleneck, we uh, we try to come uh, we try to get the balls and the plant as close as possible, but there are of course some errors and this is the first kind of feedback uh, the algorithm can can uh, get through this process uh, because of the errors uh, for example uh, the ball might go uh, too far and might uh, might touch the plant and for that reason the plant might might uh, move differently behave differently and that would kind of 
change the distribution the, the LiDAR is seeing next time it goes around it. Uh, so this is kind of one way of kind of, uh, you know, having uh, just, uh, yeah, this is, this is one idea of ongoing learning. Uh, and I, I think it's an important one since we don't want to have like a fixed data set, but we want to, uh, for the plant to be able to influence in some way um, the, the machine learning process. Uh, but the thing is, uh, the light we think, uh, doesn't see the, uh, the smaller pieces of the, of the plant, the tendrils, right? They're called tendrils. Uh, yeah, please yes. somebody not say yes. <laughs> Okay, yes. yeah, so, uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, so the, the LiDAR doesn't see the tendrils, so on the other hand, we use camera to see them and to judge whether the, 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 the plant is touching the balls. And we also use that as some form of feedback uh, to, um, to, uh, to, to train the, 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 the whole network. And here it becomes very blurry as to what to expect from the what kind what kinds of representations to expect from the whole whole uh, whole system you know because as, as as far as all these are reconstructions just so we use just the auto encoder it's always going to look something like the input uh, we give we give it to uh, but when using classifier things can be, go out of parallel really fast or they can they can they can uh, yeah, they, they, they can just uh, lead to unpredictable consequences in in a sense of how 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 the balls are moving and that kind of loop. I think I think uh, I, I know I find, find really uh, uh, really what ki kind of uh, it's the cherry on top. Uh, I I feel like in this this uh, this uh, network that we've built. Um, do they want to say anything else? No, I'll just I'll just shut up for now and <laughs> wait for more questions. Uh. Okay, but so far, so far, um, the whole system um, um, was responsive. So you, you, all of you, did something right. No? We, uh, as I understood, you are not still where you would like to be, but uh, in these responses, in this. Uh, uh, interactions that you were assuming that they would happen, you were quite correct. You know, so you prepared somehow mm. the layout of the, the whole thing, you know, um, uh, appropriately. Now, <clears throat> um, the reinteraction is there. So, and the plant is obviously alive and it's playing with dead girls, no? So, this is more like the speculation for all three of you, no? and maybe um, Benjamin, you can start. No? Can this interaction with the plant uh, influence AI, the machine learning, to adopt uh, some signs of aliveness? In the, the huh, what does it mean for something to be alive? Uh, that's 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 I, I I think at the core of your question. And, Ask Agnieszka, uh, not me. Uh, yeah, Agnieszka, what's the core of of, uh, <laughs> of something being alive? Uh, but if you ask Spela, you know, uh, probably you will say the metabolical path. No? Yeah, I mean. Hmm, mm, a, bi a biologist would would have uh, certain definitions, uh, but like when we're talking about the uh, possibility of play, I think we clearly can also understand an open-ended computational system as possessing at least this capacity. Whether uh, one has to be alive to be able to play, uh, you know, that's that's sort of where we we then end up. Um, questioning ontological categories, which might not be the most suitable for what we are trying to observe. I'm not sure that this question, if it's alive or not, uh, in a time when we see emergent complex systems 
that absolutely uh, we say are not alive and yet they have these kind of properties. I don't think this distinction matters so much at, at this point, you know? And so I wouldn't call it alive, but I would definitely, uh, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily call the uh, computer as robots alive, but definitely the, the principle of its uh, being uh, und un indeterministic and undetermined, open, continuously open uh, to uh, the changes and to this interaction within this loop uh, makes it basically unpredictable or uncalculable as a system, uh, as like most of, of reality is as well. But I think uh, this is what makes this experiment um, interesting for observation. And we can only speak about this after it's actually been running for a while. And of course, uh, yes, the, the machine is there, the cucumbers are growing and uh, wrapping around the tendrils and, and we're sort of uh, trying to um, uh, get it to, to, to properly work, but we haven't reached that point yet. So what you're asking us, or at least that's how I see it, is uh, for an insight that is yet to come. So please, can you can you ask me again in about a year's time? <laughs> when you get enough data, you know. <laughs> exactly for for sort of an intuition to develop, you know, to also be able to to come to some conclusion. Because if we take this uh, plant machine as also an experiment in in and a way to push our own conceptions, without this observation, we are still stuck in the uh, ideal world, in this world of our ideas, when it's not about that, when it's actually about radical empiricism, to see what actually happens. Mm. Anybody has to do, to, to say anything? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Because we are talking now for an, um, well, we started uh, one hour and 20 minutes ago. We have 12 minutes of video, so uh, we are more than one hour uh, here uh, discussing. Um, uh, here in the chat line, I have a uh, few questions from the audience. So, um, I'm having a question which is rather long, so maybe you have <laughs> take uh, pencils in your hand. It's a question for Spila and Agnieszka. If, if we juxtapose on one hand the human plant relationship and on another hand AI technology, plant relationship, could we see any interesting parallels? For example, an individual taking care of one or few plants takes more care and gets more attached to his individual children than farmers and other agricultural workers that do not necessarily personalize their crops. In relation to this, here we see Spela's ply that seeks to understand and make a connection, even a relationship, question mark, to its cucumber, while the large robotic infrastructures in a, in autonomous farms manifest as similar detachment to their crops than farmers. Any thoughts on this? How would you, how would an advanced self-learning neural network see the plant? Would it be their ally, companion, something that can be ignored? <laughs> yeah, very nice question. Um, I don't know, Shpala, you want to start? No, you do. <laughs> because in a way, I, I actually thought about it today, um, trying to compose some urgencies. 
And, you know, like referring back to uh, to the concept of vegetarian, of Shvtala, right? The plant always has this double being part of this biopolitical, bioprospecting. Uh, so in this case, you know, the whole agriculture uh, uh, industry and at the same time escaping it right from the humanistic or from the philosophical point of view does not really fit to any bodies that could be easily identified according to the you know classic um, uh, forms of identification so so there is something in 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 the plan that it, it's already double so in this uh, in uh, so this is this level. And then we have now the level of the, the plant and the machine that in the context of Spela work is again uh, problematic where Spela uh, uses the plan analogy um, of a plant uh, comparing it to somehow human condition in the, co in the relation with the AI, as well as taking a history of how we defined plant that, you know, plan was defined already as an as a machine. So mm. we have this 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 complex relationalities that somehow are not fixed and they condition that these relations condition and shape the way how we identify and care for these bodies, how we you know create practices with these bodies. So I wouldn't have actually one answer. I would only multiply the, the the new possibilities of 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 complexities of that that is never you know dualistic uh, somehow through the plant we multiply because because of these technologies because of possibility to have the new relationship through these technologies because of bioprospecting because of surveillance capitalism and we have no idea how these technologies will shape us because this is what is at stake and also in Spela's work, right? It's the play, the ply shapes the bodies. They, it creates new bodies. So it's not like they are defined already. Mm. Yeah, I will stop there. <laughs> no, 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 but uh, it's also exactly what, I, uh, what I'm uh, sort of pursuing, right? Um, being in these moments of uh, indecision uh, or cu cultivating um, uh, non-decision, not uh, in terms of uh, not deciding uh, what these relations uh, relations should be, but rather uh, with great intensity cultivating them regardless, right? So risking um, uh, whatever happens when you allow um, these algorithms to become intimate with, in this case, um, the plants which are in my care and which I care about. So there's always this uh, possibility of um, things going wrong and, and turning from, uh, let's say, uh, a benevolent critique and a sort of a hope for... Um, a different type of uh, resistance, resilience, and care, that in fact we would be reinforcing um, the origin, which which was kind of extractivist, of algorithms, right? It was uh, colonial. Uh, so a lot of these algorithms, which is what the whole discourse about algorithmic biases and how they're applied uh, to human populations, etc., is about. So engaging in... in uh, this kind of work poses its own challenges and what uh, Agnieszka talks about is risk. But we cannot afford not to do this. We cannot afford to uh, be uh, to, to stand back and, and be critical and only think about these things because we, uh, un, un, until we actually engage, we have no idea what the possibilities are, what the scope of the possible of this uh, algorithmic is and I've come to realize that it's not quite what one would imagine in, in terms of exactly this recursivity exactly it's, it's it's it can be much more queer hopefully I don't know I hope that it is much more queer uh, than than we think mm. 
<clears throat> Benjamin, listening these uh, um, answers, well, um, it came to my mind. Did you have time to reflect as a, as a part of this real machine you you said that you belong? No. Did you have the opportunity to reflect about your position in this uh, uh, configuration <laughs> here in Spela's projects? And can you take something with you and how it would be if you would discuss this with your uh, uh, colleagues in the real machine or the um, machine? Of yeah, so something just clicked earlier when Agnieszka was, was speaking uh, about about uh, developing technology without even knowing what kind, kind of uh, which kind kind kinds of influences it's gonna have on us, like in a very which is very very similar to what we are doing to the. Uh, to the to the installation we are uh, developing, uh, and it's 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 I, I would say that some uh, scientific communities are more open to uh, such discussions than others. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I, I I guess there's room for uh, for improvement when it comes to when it comes to just uh, uh, discussing such ideas and what kinds of influences. Because in my experiences, the in my experience. Uh, with whom I've talked uh, to about most about s s such issues, like um, you know, like how algorithms are biased, uh, and it's a, it's a big issue also in in, uh, in 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 computer science, not 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 just in hum hum uh, and ethics, for example. It's not just issue in uh, humanistics, but uh, but I've mostly talked uh, about these kinds of problems with people who have some kind of background in ethics. Uh, and so on, and it, and why I think this is this is uh, this project this project we are working on uh, why it's uh, important is precisely because it interconnects uh, you know these kinds of different backgrounds and not and also empower me as an engineer to think uh, think about these kinds of things um, which which is not uh, at least in my experience it's not always the case that we, you have such a colorful. Uh, backgrounds in one place. Um, of course, I can imagine. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm su super satisfied that um, there is the opportunity um, for this kind of discussions. Uh, of it. They are very important. No? So let's go to the next uh, question, which is um, uh, for for Spela particularly. Um, so it feels all of the works from plant machine series have a kind of humoristic playful qualities not only apply how do you see the role of those lighter kinder in question mark approaches in your artistic expression and maybe also in art in general mm. um i think these are I'll, I'll give a really short answer I think that in these uh, dire times with really serious topics uh, in mind, uh, addressing them requires almost a bit of humor and a bit of lightheartedness. It's, yeah, it's a must. This, what we are dealing with, uh, the, I don't know, the others like the humanities um, um, are really um, concerned with, really afraid they, they are yeah, basically tough, tough topics, and so humor, a humorous approach, um, allows us to to engage with them without immediately um, having some sort of uh, anxiety about the implications. So it's an invitation. It's an invitation to the topics themselves, but also uh, to a wider uh, public that I hope uh, they reach because of this. But might be also functioning as a commodification of these very important and difficult questions as well. Well, the commodification, reading it that way uh, means that uh, the person who only sees it like that doesn't necessarily get the word, which is also fine. 
it's a risk. No, but I would say it's part of it, if I may add, uh, you know, so uh, so this is something that Spella already said that, you know, we need to engage. Uh, we, we cannot afford to uh, have a comfortable, critical, judgmental relation. And, and this is, for instance, within the humanities, right, this is how, um, yeah, we are we are operating a lot uh, uh, around anxiety uh, uh, when it comes to new biotechnologies, digital technologies, and AI. So how to not be affirmative, naively affirmative, and yet have a form of possibility to think otherwise, uh, creating a condition rather than surrendering or negating, like in the dialectic, you know, negation, um, in order to create, but, you know, mutating from within. And I think Spella is, you know, um, creating a methodology through laughter, um, which allows you to become with, to, to, to find yourself um, uh, mutating. Because, you know, through the laughter, somehow you, you indeed start first laughing and enjoying, but it, it's intimate. So through this maneuver of intimate, creating an intimate condition of relationality, we we start to um, uh, think on, uh, think differently. Maybe this is yeah. Maybe this is a, a, a form of strategy to uh, to think otherwise. So I wouldn't say it's it's it has a danger of commodification. Um, Okay, let's go further on. There is one question coming from YouTube. Um, question about the power by which the AI is powered. Did you see any morphic dynamism towards the wires and the source of robots power? <laughs> <laughs> Who's gonna answer? <laughs> Uh, I don't quite understand, Benjamin. Uh, it seems like it's in your domain. Uh, I, I don't know if it's in my domain because it talks about plants, but uh, but I think I think we talked about this this idea of of the electrical wires being being uh, under electrical current and how that might be might be uh, you know uh, steering the plants. But I, I I remember just talking about it. I, I have no expertise in understanding how that would work. Uh, but I think that the question is kind, kind of aiming at uh, at uh, at that at that maybe I don't know. Uh, uh -huh. ah, but uh, uh, so it's it's about I, I thought the, the question was about the robots looking for its power source. But yes, uh, I don't know. So anyway, um, in, indeed, um, the sensing uh, technique that we used uh, initially uh, was to to do like this um, proximity sensing uh, by measuring uh, capacitance. And for this, you need to send a little bit of electricity down the wires. But of course, electricity also serves to excite uh, living tissue including plants. So it seemed that um, this is not scientifically proven. Maybe we were just like looking too much <laughs> into this, but it seemed like um, the plants that actually touched, the, the uh, tendrils that touched these wires wrapped around them with such speed that we were really amazed at how fast this went. We were literally sitting on the couch watching it happen in real time, like within the span of 10 minutes. It was quite fascinating to see this happen so fast. And in fact, uh, plants are reactive uh, to um, this electrical stimulation. That's science tells us. Whether this is what happens, I suppose something like this happens uh, in the case of uh, plants and tendrils, and uh, but we haven't uh, done this research scientifically. Maybe we should turn, you know, half of the balls off and half of them on, and just see the plant migrate to to to, to, the, to the electrified half. <laughs> uh, 
Exactly. No, in the in the next iteration, we hope because we ended up realizing that this is not a sensing system we could use. Instead, we're doing uh, the sensing via visual analysis. Uh, we might be using uh, this type of uh, stimulation as another possibility of the robot to be able to entice the plants. Uh, but we're not at that stage yet, just yet. Yeah. Mm. There is another question uh, for Spela and Agnieszka. Maybe it's for Agnieszka and Spela. Play is uh, one of the primal, basic, but also most important building blocks of recognizing ourselves, others, and building relationships. But as it is in human and other animals, play gets less and less present as we grow and gets substituted by more mature learned and programmed interactions and relationships. If a game between a plant and AI could be considered as one of the first step of their mutual understanding, could we speculate a bit on future more developed interactions and relationships? I don't know if I, I'm, I, I don't know if I'm equipped properly to answer. Of course, we can and we should, no? Yes. Yes, we should. We hope. Yes. <laughs> yes. So one of the uh, like underlying uh, desires for these algorithms uh, is to be able to find sort of like a possibility of them actually. Uh, being like pl pleasurable to us, to plants and to us, or just the, so the question of whether algorithms could not necessarily have a goal, but rather grow with us and develop in such a way um, to provide us with this erotic, like the feminist type of erotic, right? This uh, sort of pleasure to be alive. So this is, in, in a way, it's a controversial proposal because so far they seem to be doing anything but that. And this is why uh, this, again, utopia, utopia, which is actually an exotopia. So the pursuits of, uh, pleasure. That's what we are going for. I'm going for that. And I think, hope the others as well. <clears throat> Here is the last question. Uh, in the thread, it's really nice. Uh, I see it really nice for the conclusion of the whole. It's very Taoistic, uh, fishy. Um, <laughs> It's question for all uh, for all three of you. And the question goes, who here really is the connecting link between the species? Who learns, teaches the most? Is it the AI, the human or the plant? <laughs> I would deflect the question <laughs> by saying <laughs> by saying that the lines are i think just you know like between us and uh, between the plant and the machine and everything are so blurred uh, that it's really hard to say what influences what and in that sense uh, what is teaching what is just oh, I, I i see everything in a very cybernetic kind of way uh, meaning that i see everything just like in loops and uh, interconnected and it's it's uh, for me, it would be really hard to answer this question, but it might be a not, but it might be a wrong take on it. But that's 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 how I understand it. Um, yeah, I agree with Benjamin. <laughs> I would use the word reciprocity. <laughs> or, or, or that, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's a a, a, a beautiful uh, rhetorical question. <laughs> So thank you for whoever posted it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you know who posted it. Um, 
Okay, to bring us to the end, I guess. Um, would you like to say anything more? No. Um, I would so, like to say thank you uh, uh, to also uh, um, Kersnikova Institute and Kapilica Gallery uh, for um, creating the conditions for us to create the conditions for play to happen. <laughs> uh, thank you for, for your support and during these really difficult times uh, during the lockdown that's situated also in, in uh, time and space um, we've really had the possibility to turn the whole gallery into basically like a, a studio space with this flurry of activity and to uh, also be able to make it through uh, those months actually together so I feel very very privileged um, for for this experience thank you uh, thank you, thank to team, to Micha, to Eric, uh, to Meta, who are not uh, featuring here in this talk, yes. but they to Adriana, uh, to uh, Jos and David, and yes, that it was really to Bor, uh, and it was just really uh, an incredible experience. So. Thank you for a lovely conversation. <laughs> it was really a pleasure this uh, gloomy evening. <laughs> nice to yeah, hear. I don't know what I would do otherwise, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Privilege. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that's bring us uh, to an end. Uh, thank um, you everyone who was um, listening at us, uh, who posted uh, your questions. I hope the, you are satisfied with the answers. Um, the project is going to be still around. We are planning it to uh, present it as a whole this autumn in Ljubljana. Hopefully we'll be all vaccinated several times by then. Um, and um, well, uh, welcome on our next um, broadcasting that will be announced uh, pretty soon, I guess. Good night. <laughs>